Sylvia Seltoon ate her breakfast at the morning room at Yesney with a pleasant sense of ultimate victory. Fate had willed that her life should be occupied with a series of small struggles, usually with the odds slightly against her, and usually she had just managed to come through winning. Now she felt that she had brought her hardest and certainly her most important struggle to a successful issue. To have married Mortimer Seltoon in the teeth of the cold hostility of his family and in spite of his unaffected indifference to women, was indeed an achievement that it needed some determination to carry through. Yesterday, she had brought her victory to its concluding stage by wrenching her husband away from town and settling him down in this remote Woodgirt Manor Farm, which was his country house. You will never get Mortimer to go, his mother had said carpingly, but if he once goes, he'll stay. Yesney throws almost as much a spell over him as town does, one can understand what holds him in town, but Yesney. There was a somber, almost savage wildness about Yesney that was certainly not likely to appeal to townbred tastes. And Sylvia, notwithstanding her name, was accustomed to nothing much more sylvan than leafy Kensington. She looked on the country as something excellent and wholesome in its way, which was apt to become troublesome if you encouraged it overmuch. Distrust of town life had been a new thing with her, born of her marriage with Mortimer, and she had watched with satisfaction the gradual fading of what she called the German street look in his eyes as the woods and heather of Yesney had closed in on them yesternight. Her willpower and strategy had prevailed. Mortimer would stay. Outside the morning room windows was a triangular slope of turf, and beyond its low hedge a steeper slope of heather and bracken dropped down into cavernous combs overgrown with oak and yew. In its wild, open savagery, there seemed a stealthy linking of the joy of life with the terror of unseen things. Sylvia smiled complacently as she gazed at the landscape, and then of a sudden she almost shuddered. It is very wild, she said to Mortimer. One could almost think that in such a place the worship of Pan had never quite died out. The worship of Pan never has died out, said Mortimer. Other and newer gods have drawn aside his votaries from time to time but he is the nature god to whom all must come back at last. Sylvia was religious in an honest, vaguely devotional kind of way and did not like to hear her belief spoken of as mere aftergrowths, but it was at least something new and hopeful to hear Mortimer speak with such energy and conviction on any subject. You don't really believe in Pan? she asked incredulously. I've been a fool in most things, said Mortimer quietly. But I'm not such a fool as not to believe in Pan when I'm down here. And if you're wise, you won't disbelieve in him too boastfully while you're in his country. It was not till a week later, when Sylvia had exhausted the possibilities of the woodland walks around Yesney, that she ventured on an inspection of the farm buildings. A farmyard suggested in her mind a scene of cheerful bustle with churns and flails and smiling dairymaids. As she wandered among the gaunt grey buildings of Yesney Manor Farm, her first impression was one of crushing stillness and desolation, as though she had happened on some lone deserted homestead long given over to owls and cobwebs. Then came a sense of furtive, watchful hostility, the same shadow of unseen things that seemed to lurk in the wooded combs and coppices. From a distant corner, a shaggy dog watched her with intent, unfriendly eyes. As she drew near, it slipped quietly into its kennel, and slipped out again as noiselessly when she had passed by. A few hens questing for food under a rick stole away under a gate at her approach. Sylvia felt that if she had come across any human beings in this wilderness of barn and byre, they would have fled, wraith-like, from her gaze. At last, turning a corner, she came upon a living thing that did not fly from her. A stretch in a pool of mud was an enormous sow speedily alert to resent and, if necessary, repel the unwanted intrusion. It was Sylvia's turn to make an unobtrusive retreat. As she threaded her way past rickyards and cowsheds, she started suddenly at a strange sound, the echo of a boy's laughter, golden and equivocal. Jan, the only boy employed on the farm, was visibly at work halfway up the nearest hillside, and Mortimer, when questioned, knew of no other probable or possible begetter of the hidden mockery that had ambushed Sylvia's retreat. The memory of that untraceable echo was added to her other impressions of a furtive, sinister something that hung around Yesney. 
Of Mortimer, she saw very little. Farm and woods and trout streams seemed to swallow him up from dawn till dusk. Once, following the direction she had seen him take in the morning, she came to an open space in a nut copse, in the center of which stood a stone pedestal surmounted by a bronze figure of a youthful pan. It was a beautiful piece of workmanship, but her attention was chiefly held by the fact that a newly cut bunch of grapes had been placed as an offering at his feet. Grapes were none too plentiful at the manor house, and Sylvia snatched the bunch angrily from the pedestal. Contemptuous annoyance dominated her thoughts as she strolled slowly homeward, and then gave way to a sharp feeling of something that was very near fright. Across a thick tangle of undergrowth, a boy's face was scowling at her, brown, beautiful, with unutterably evil eyes. It was a lonely pathway, and she sped forward without waiting to give closer scrutiny to this sudden apparition. It was not until she had reached the house that she discovered that she had dropped the bunch of grapes in her flight. I saw a youth in the wood today, she told Mortimer that evening. Brown-faced and rather handsome, but a scoundrel to look at. A gypsy lad, I suppose. A reasonable theory, said Mortimer. Only there aren't any gypsies in these parts at present. Then who was he? asked Sylvia. And as Mortimer appeared to have no theory of his own, she passed on to recount her finding of the votive offering. Did you meddle with it in any way? asked Mortimer. Ah, I threw the grapes away. It seemed so silly. I don't think you were wise to do that. I've heard it said that the wood gods are rather horrible to those who molest them. Horrible, perhaps, to those who believe in them, but you see, I don't. All the same, I should avoid the woods and orchards if I were you and give a wide berth to the horned beasts on the farm. Mortimer, said Sylvie suddenly, I think we will go back to town sometime soon. Her victory had not been so complete as she had supposed. It had carried her on to the ground where she was already anxious to quit. I don't think you will ever go back to town, said Mortimer. Sylvia noted with dissatisfaction that the course of her next afternoon's ramble took her instinctively clear of the woods. As to the horned cattle, Mortimer's warning was scarcely needed, for she had always regarded them as of doubtful neutrality at the best. The ram who fed in the narrow paddock below the orchards she had adjudged to be of docile temper. Today, however, she decided to leave his docility untested for the usually tranquil beast was roaming with every sign of restlessness from corner to corner of his meadow. A low, fitful piping as of some reedy flute was coming from the depth of a neighboring copse, and there seemed to be some subtle connection between the animal's restless pacing and the wild music from the wood. Sylvia turned her steps in an upward direction and climbed the heather-clad slopes that stretched in rolling shoulders high above Yesney. She had left the piping notes behind her, but across the wooded combes, the wind brought her another kind of music, the straining bay of hounds in full chase. Sylvia could presently see a dark body breasting hill after hill, while behind him steadily swelled that relentless chorus, and she grew tense with the excited sympathy that one feels for any hunted thing in whose capture one is not directly interested. At last, he broke through the outermost line of oak scrub and fern and stood panting in the open a fat September stag carrying a well-furnished head. His obvious course was to drop down to the brown pools of Undercombe and thence to the sea. To Sylvia's surprise, however, he turned his head to the upland slope and came lumbering resolutely onward over the heather. It would be dreadful. The hounds would pull him down under my very eyes. But the music of the pack seemed to have died away for a moment. And in its place, she heard again that wild piping, which rose now on this side, now on that, as though urging the failing stag to a final effort. Sylvia stood well aside from his path, half hidden in a thick growth of wattle bushes, and watched him swing stiffly upward, his flanks dark with sweat, the coarse hair on his neck showing light by contrast. The pipe music shrilled suddenly around her, seeming to come from the bushes at her very feet. And at the same moment, the great beast slewed round and bore directly down upon her. In an instant, her pity for the hunted animal was changed to wild terror at her own danger. The thick heather roots mocked her scrambling efforts at flight, and she looked frantically downward for a glimpse of oncoming hounds. 
The huge antler spikes were within a few yards of her, and in a flash of numbing fear, she remembered Mortimer's warning to beware of horned beasts on the farm. And then, with a quick throb of joy, she saw that she was not alone. A human figure stood a few paces aside, knee-deep in the wattle bushes. Drive it off, she shrieked. But the figure made no answering movement. The antlers drove straight at her breast. The acrid smell of the hunted animal was in her nostrils, but her eyes were filled with the horror of something she saw other than her oncoming death. And in her ears rang the echo of a boy's laughter, golden and equivocal. <laughs>